I'm used to, I'm used to saying you're live. Folks, welcome back to the Roswell UFO Conference. You're about to see Dr. Michael S. Heiser, PhD. This is one of the most anticipated lectures of this entire event. And believe it or not, responses to this lecture are already being circulated among ufological circles. Responses and debate about what Mike is going to bring, and he hasn't even given the article yet. He hasn't given the lecture yet. It's very groundbreaking. Um, to give you his personal history is here. I'll give you that in a second. But Mike's also no stranger to Roswell. He's been here since 2003 presenting at our Ancient of Days UFOs and Theology Conferences, as well as the San Francisco area Bay Area Conference and the Washington DC X Conference on could Christianity accommodate a genuine ET reality. Very good personal friend. His wife, Drina, is here as well. Uh, they're people I go to with my problems. He's been a really good friend, inspiration, theologically. I love having his uh, credentials and really his uh, humble manner uh, representing uh, the conferences that I've been able to put together, as well as making Roswell look good, like so many of these other people have done. I'll give Mike more time with the microphone, though. and read you his brief, no lie, biographical sketch that Mike Heiser earned his Ph.D. in Hebrew Bible and ancient Semitic languages from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he has also earned two MA degrees in the fields of ancient history, Egyptology, and Syria-Palestine from the University of Pennsylvania, and Biblical Hebrew and Semitic languages from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. After teaching on the undergraduate level for 12 years, Mike took his current position as academic editor for Logos Bible Software, a software research company that creates ancient language research software and digital resources for studying the ancient and biblical world. His academic interests include Israelite religion, Northwest Semitic languages, Second Temple, Second Temple Jewish literature, Jewish and Christian monotheism in the early common era, and biblical theology. Mike is best known to those interested in ufology for his critiques of the ancient astronaut theories and ancient texts, as well as his interest in how mainstream religion might respond to an ET reality. His novel, The Facade, deals with all of these subjects. Mike will no doubt become well known in the UFO community for being the first researcher to have the majestic documents tested by modern computational linguistic methods. Please welcome up Dr. Michael S. Heiser, PhD. Are we on or should I hold the one? Okay. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. And this is, uh, as Guy told you or hinted at, this is a first. So you'll be able to say at some point, I was there when you know, Heiser did his session in Roswell on testing the majestic documents. What you're going to see is something that has never been done before. I don't know why. Uh, it, it could have been done in the last 15 to 20 years. But no one has undertaken it. And I may say a little bit about that as we go through. But what I want to do is sort of take you through. I had to make up a title a few months ago. So I said, hey, authentication and interpretation. What you're really going to get is authentication. Uh, I, I'm sure I'll be able to, use, to leave a good bit of Q&A uh, for questions. And then we may get into interpretation at that point. Uh, because I only got the test results in June. Uh, I, I, had, I sent these things off to a leader in the field and had to wait, um, just like you know, some of you have had to wait weeks and weeks and weeks since you heard a little bit about this. I had to wait months to get the results back. And so I want to, uh, of course, give you the results. But I also want to take you through the process. What, what did I do? What did I have done? What does it mean? A little bit of background on it so you know the significance of it. This is a good case of hard science being applied to UFO studies. Now, I've said many times before, I don't have a dog in this fight. I am not a professional ufologist. I have a day job. I don't do this for a living. I don't need any money from it. Okay, I just want to know. And there are areas that I'm taught in, I'm trained in. I want to apply those to questions like, well, what, are the majestic documents real or not? I mean, what, what can we say? What, what can be tested? That sort of thing. And so that's what I did. I had no idea what to expect. So with that said, let's jump in here. This is a basic outline of what we're going to be going over. There's going to be an introduction, an overview of the process, the sources for the documents, 
how they were selected, and they were, they were selected according to the methods that, frankly, I could afford because this is self-funded. Uh, I'm going to be pitching you and pitching a very large audience on the 12th of July. I'm going to be a guest on Coast to Coast. And what I need to fund further research is I need to find 500 people who care. If there ain't 500 people who care about this, then that will say something to me, and it will probably say something to the wider UFO community. I'm going to go through the results then and comment on them and then talk about what could be done in the future. Now, the basic idea for this came to me when I was at the X conference in 2005. It was during a lecture by Ryan Wood, and the Woods, Robert Wood, Dr. Robert Wood, and his son Ryan, <coughs> who are most well known for their work on the Majestic Documents, they are not connected with this study, this research at all. Uh, to my, I don't even know if they know about it because it's really been under the radar. Uh, but I got an idea as I was listening to Ryan Wood, and he had the word stylometry on one of his PowerPoint slides. And, and being a biblical scholar, I knew what stylometry was, and I'm going to explain that to you today. And I thought, hmm, I wonder why they haven't done that, because he said we haven't done that. But it's something he threw out there that could be done. And I, and I thought about it for a while, and it, it just, you know, one thing led to another. I got busy with my job. But around January, I thought, you know, I should really do this. I think I can save enough money to get it done, so let's try it. And I did. Now, the need, of course, is that it's never been attempted, and I wanted to try to build on other testing. Here's what the Woods have done, and they've really put a lot of work, a lot of effort, and so has Stanton Friedman and some others, into this kind of testing. This is not what I had done. This has already been done before. This has limitations. They did things like physical dating of ink and pencil and, you know, do the do the, do the keys on certain typewriters of the period in which this document was supposed to be typed, do they match the typeface on the document? What about the ink, its composition? Formula, dating formula, how you know, the, the sort of outline method or the salutation method uh, that was used in a document, does that jive with similar styles that were used in the period? So it was sort of a chronological testing. They, had, they did testing on watermarks, chemical composition of the paper. Again, these are physical tests. Comparison with known events. Handwriting they've done a little bit with. The stamps on certain majestic documents. Are they consistent with stamps used in the period? That sort of thing. All that has been done. I did not want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I think we should be thankful to the woods that they've you know, really put the effort into doing what they've done. But this surpasses what they've done in, in significant ways. Now, as far as a linguistic testing claim, some of you are thinking, well, I, I've read about, you know, I've read somewhere before that the majestic documents have been tested by a linguist. Well, not really. Kind of, sort of. And frankly, no. Now, here's the quotation that you might be thinking. This is Stanton Friedman. And I don't mean this in any way negatively towards Stanton. He, he was honest. This is what he had done, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. At the suggestion of attorney Bob Bletchman, I had obtained 27 examples of Hillencotter's various writings from the Truman Library. He hands them to a, doc, uh, a linguist, and the guy was a linguist named Dr. Westcott. He reviewed these. Well, what does that mean? He reviewed these and the EBD, the Eisenhower Briefing Document, and stated April 7, 1988, letter to Bob, in my opinion, there's no compelling reason to regard any of these communications as fraudulent or to believe that any of them were written by anyone other than Hill and Cotter himself. This statement holds for the controversial presidential briefing memorandum of November 18, 1952, as well as for letters, both official and personal. End of quote. What Stanton Friedman did was he took some documents, handed them to a linguist, and said, hey, what do you think? Could they be real? And the guy says, well, I don't really see any you know, any reason they couldn't be. Problems with the claim. There's no proof that the linguist did any testing. There's none. I mean, you, where are the results? Where are the tests? Where's the data? Where are the reports? All that kind of thing. Computational methods were only invented in the 1980s. Okay? Dr. Westcott's specialty was anthropological linguistics. Did he ever even use a computer? He got his, de his degree in the 40s. So he may not have ever even used a personal computer. We don't know that he actually did anything that would hold up in court or that would really qualify as, 
as stylometric analysis. We, we just don't know. There's no evidence that anything like this was ever done. And frankly, I'm sure that if it was done, we would have all heard about it because it would have, it would have been big news. Now, the last comment here, non-computational methods have been invalidated and they are not accepted as legal evidence. Where do I get that claim? I get that from the legal field. There's a whole history behind this and I'm gonna take a little sidebar here. The evolution of legal evidence standards for scientific evidence. Legal proceedings have long been, have long required some kind of authentication of documentary evidence. I mean, somebody writes something down, it becomes part of a court case, even if it's in the 1700s, you know, it's still part of the evidence, you know, to decide the case, whatever the case concerns. Until the 19th century, a document was typically authenticated by an eyewitness to its creation. So if somebody watched this person write that letter, that was how you validated it. Again, they didn't have the technology. This kind of document authentication is still admissible testimony under the Federal Rules of Evidence, Rule 901. But what if no such person is available or willing to testify in that regard? Which, of course, is the case with the majestic material. In the early 19th century, another kind of document authentication came on the scene. Now, we're talking about the early 19th century. This is the 1800s. And that was comparison by an expert of the question document with known writing samples. In 1913, the U.S. Code permitted the admissibility of handwriting identification by an expert testimony. So back in the 1800s, the state of the art was, okay, we have a document here. There's nobody living that can say, I saw that document written by the person that, whose name is on it. So they had experts in handwriting analysis come along, try to develop that field and say, yeah, I think this document was written by person X because I'm really familiar with his handwriting style, the physical style, the way the letters are formed and connected and all that sort of thing. So that was 1913. In 1923, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Fry v. United States that scientific testimony should be limited by its, quote, general acceptance within the scientific community. Question document examination was, in a sense, immune from such scrutiny since any lawyer seeking to introduce it in court could argue that it was directly admissible by statute, the old Rule 901. That didn't set well with some people. In 1993, 70 years after Fry, the Fry case, the U.S. Supreme Court heard Daubert v. Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals Incorporated which resulted in major changes in the way that expert testimony is admitted as scientific evidence. The court ruled, now catch this, this is important. The court ruled that testimony, if it is to be considered scientific, must be demonstrated to have characteristics shared by established sciences like biology or chemistry. Well, what kind of characteristics? Well, the, the, the court ruling actually listed some. For us to accept your scientific argument as valid evidence in court, legally, your scientific stuff has to include empirical testing. You have to tell us the known or potential rate of error. You have to establish standard procedures for performing a technique. It has to be subject to peer review and publication in peer-reviewed publications. And there has to be some means of measurement, replication, which means other people have to duplicate it. We're familiar with this if, you, if your background is science. This is how science is done. You form a hypothesis, you do a test, you get a result. Is it replicable by someone else? And ideally, people around the world. If it's replicable by everybody using the same methods, it's like, wow, this must be correct. Well, they said you need to have replication here and you need predictability. In a Daubert hearing, one held to determine whether evidence can be admitted as scientific, Professor Barry Sheck, who, know, who remembers Barry Sheck? The OJ trial. This was the guy that made a mess of the DNA evidence. <laughs> okay, here he is again. Okay, Barry Sheck attacked question document examination on the basis of its scientific foundation. So Sheck was involved in a case where someone was trying to introduce scientific evidence related to uh, analysis of a piece of writing and Sheck did what Sheck apparently does really well. He muddied the waters and he referred to the Daubert decision and said, look, this doesn't conform to the rules of scientific evidence. <coughs> District Judge McKenna agreed the Daubert hearing established that forensic document examination 
which clothes itself with the trappings of science does not rest on carefully articulated postulates. It does not employ rigorous methodology and has not convincingly documented the accuracy of its determinations. Now, what does that mean for our current topic? Well, it meant that document examination methods predating the current methods of testing. In other words, 1993 was when Daubert handed, you know, this, this decision was applied. Anything prior to 1993 was going to get hammered in court because they're going to re-reference re the whole Sheck thing, that whole decision, McKenna, the judge agreeing. So anything preceding that did not meet the rules for evidence. Document testing therefore faced an uphill battle in meeting the standards of evidence laid out in the Fry decision. New technology and methods were needed. Even if Dr. Westcott had actually done some sort of testing for Stanton Friedman, and there's no evidence that he did, the testing would not and could not meet the rules of legal, legal evidence. It would just be worthless, unfortunately, but that's just the way it is. Wouldn't matter. So what's happened since? In July 1996, one year after Daubert, the National Institute of Justice sponsored a workshop on how question document examination might develop principles and methods that would meet or exceed the Daubert criteria for scientific evidence. Dr. Carol Chasky, her, her name is in red for a reason. She is the computational linguist who I had test the majestic documents. She has been among the experts who have succeeded in creating processes that meet this standard. Okay, I was able to track Dr. Chasky down. She is a leader in the field. If you Google things like authorship attribution, stylometry, document authentication and linguistics, her name's gonna pop up. So I literally sent her an email after I was almost done typing everything in and I had some assistance from some Roswell residents here uh, to do that and said, hey, are you interested in this? And she said, yeah, I'm interested. Chasky, I just want to give you an idea. And what I'm concerned about is, do I have good people doing the work? Will their work stand up in court? Well, Dr. Chasky, this is her resume from the web. She has a PhD in linguistics from Brown University. Her doctoral work was actually, actually dealt with the, her creation of the software that she now uses, sort of the guts of it. I mean, she's, a, she's kept up with it and advanced it as part of the process to meet the legal standards of evidence. But she's been doing this a long time, and here's what stuck out to me about her. Examples of forensic linguistic consulting. Look at the list of court cases that her work has been used in and applied and held up in court. I'm still going. Okay, well, we've just got another page here. And we're still going. I think it's the, oh, there we go. Well, we're in another different area of research. By the way, she is the only, uh, her, her institute is the only body that does this kind of testing that has received federal grant money to do it. This is arguably the top person in the field. She's not going to blow it. Okay. Now her methods and testing have held up in court. The majestic documents have never been tested in such a scientific manner as they were these past months. And of course, this past month is when I got the results. There's just no better person to do it. So let's talk about what she did. Okay. What is authorship attribution, presuppositions, history, uses, and this thing we call stylometry? The discipline of authorship attribution is a way of determining who wrote a text when it is unclear who wrote it or of ruling out the validity of some claim of authorship. So if, you know, if I was involved in a court case and there was this document, I said, no, I didn't write that. Well, this, these kinds of testing methods would either prove 90% or better that, yep, Heiser wrote this or no, there, there's just no way that he wrote it. But this guy over here, that the defense is blaming, 
we tested his writing too, and that, you know, that's a dead ringer right there. So it can, it can demonstrate who wrote something or who didn't write something. In a typical scenario, a set of documents with known authorship are used as a control sample. Through sophisticated computer technology, linguistic patterns are detected in an author's style. That's what we call stylometry. The linguistic patterns of the test document are then compared to the control data to see whether the linguistic patterns match. So if Dr. Chasky wanted to prove that I wrote something, again, with a high, high degree of probability, she would test lots of stuff that I'm written that I don't dispute. Yep, I wrote this pile of stuff. She would just pour all that into her computer program. The computer would detect stylistic things that I do when I write. And then it would come up with a set of patterns that I have. And then she would run those patterns against the unknown, the disputed one, and ask the simple question, do they match? Now, the methods are based on certain presuppositions which have been confirmed by years of validation testing. For Dr. Chasky to, to meet the Daubert criteria uh, for legal evidence standards and scientific standards, she had to be able to demonstrate that her processes work on known material. She gets the correct result. And she's been doing that for years. When authors write, they use certain words unconsciously. Each of us has habits that make his or her writing unique, a so-called linguistic fingerprint. The computer extracts features from a text that can distinguish one author from another. And through advances in machine learning and natural language processing, they make that extraction very sophisticated. Now, primitive methods for doing something like this before computers uh, were around, but they were novel for their time. Go back to 1887. Mendenhall's work was followed by a work, the work of a guy named Ewell in 1938 and Morton in 1965. They didn't have computers. Computational methods began in the 80s. Again, this is, this is at the end of Dr. Westcott's career. Again, the, the linguist that Stanton Friedman mentions. We don't, like I said, we don't even know if the guy ever used a computer. He was not a computational linguist, and he couldn't be because the methods were new. And before the mid-1990s, the methods were considered invalid in terms of holding up in court. Common contemporary uses. Where have you might have heard of this before? Stylometry is used to analyze anonymous or disputed documents or books, such as plays of Shakespeare. Every once in a while, something will come along, and it'll, it's something that Shakespeare scholars aren't familiar with, but it has Shakespeare's name on it, or it looks like Shakespeare. So there's a website here, shakespeareauthorship.com, where you can see some of the methods used in that example. Plagiarism detection. Those of us who have taught uh, really enjoy when we can nail somebody who plagiarizes. It's a lot of fun. The book Primary Colors. Anybody remember this? There was an anonymous book released that sounded an awful light, lot like uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton when they were on the campaign trail. And there was a dispute. You know, no, nobody knew who wrote it. Once they had a suspect, they called in a stylometrist. And they nailed them. And then the person fessed up. Yep, it was me. The Unabomber. Once the authorities believed that Ted Kaczynski was the Unabomber, they took material that he had written, put it through a, you know, some stylometric programs, some software, extracted patterns, and ran them against the anonymous notes that the Unabomber had written. And guess what? This is the guy. Forensic investigations also use this on, I don't want to unsettle anyone, but on emails and <laughs> news group messages. Uh, our, our company actually just hired uh, a guy who wanted to get out of the defense industry who was a computational linguist. And his job before coming to our Bible software company was reading your email and designing the programs for things like carnivore. He got tired of doing that. He thought of this would be much more interesting. So we're glad to have him, and he's glad to be out of it. I guess he has a conscience. Stylometry now. Again, the science of determining literary markers. What are some examples? Well, you can study the rarest, most striking features of a writer. That's not really the best thing to do, because that can be faked. Let's say that I, I know I want to fake a document written by some guy who's a physicist. 
If I know a little bit about physics, that's good because I can do research and study physics books and pull out unique vocabulary that a physicist would use and put them in my document. Okay, unique vocabulary isn't a very good test. It's much harder when you can study patterns for how writers use words like and, to, but, prepositions and conjunctions. Believe it or not, when you write, when I write, I subconsciously use very, very common words in patterns. It would take a lifetime for someone to study my writings, and probably that person wouldn't have a life, to find out how I use if, how I use prepositions. But a computer can do that in a few minutes, a few seconds, depending on what you're looking for. While unusual vocabulary can be adapted or incorporated in faking, it's hard for anybody to do, to do the opposite. Now today, a stylometrist could do it. I mean, we, I could go hire a stylometrist to fake a majestic document. I, you know, hey, go study FDR's stylistic patterns, and then like, let's, let's write up a document that matches those patterns, and then let's go have another stylometrist test it and say, wow, it's authentic. I mean, you can do that today, 2007. Couldn't do that in the 50s. Other style markers. Believe it or not, you have an average sentence length. Mine is rare, very long. <laughs> average syllables per word. Uh, no comment. Average word length. Distribution of parts of speech. How do I use nouns, verbs, prepositions, and conjunctions in combination with each other? There's a pattern. Word frequencies. How often do I use certain words? How often do I use those little function words? Even punctuation. How often does Mike use a semicolon and where? Okay. That is, that's impossible to fake. Syntactic patterns, sentence, you know, larger sentence structures. No single test criterion is conclusive. This is an important point. But the combined results of all these factors, if you had a software program that could munge them all together, and then you take the patterns there and go to the unknown, then you'd have something. Guess what? That's what Dr. Chasky does. That's what her program does. Now, this is a quote from Dr. Chasky in one of her published articles. My syntactic analysis method has obtained an accuracy rate of 95%. The primary difference between the syntactic analysis method and other computational stylometric methods is the syntactic methods, linguistic, blah, 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 blah. Who cares? 95%. Now, the, what I could afford, I had her cut some things out. So she would only say to me, I'm, I'm going to make that figure 90% for you because we didn't do everything that I could have done. And I said, okay, I'm willing to live with that. Maybe we can raise the money to do the whole nine yards. Let's talk about the documents, get into the actual tests. The Majestic documents are, of course, widely available, most notably on the Woods uh, site, but, of course, other sources on the Internet and in print. The documents tested were taken from Internet websites or, again, in print. I mean, I, I got a variety of sources here. And I typed them by hand into usable electronic form, TXT file. And uh, Free and Amy uh, here in Roswell, who are running the, the conference, helped me finish that up so I could get the testing done in time. But that's all we did. We had, by the way, I should say, I was interested in the text. I didn't worry about headings. I didn't worry about uh, stamps on documents. All we were interested in retyping and testing was what did the person write? all the sentences, all the paragraphs, that kind of thing. Documents that bore a specific author name were, were selected. Now, the reason that we had to do it this way is because a majestic document had to have a name on it. It had to have a claimed author so that I could go collect the control samples. Let's say there's a memo here in 1947 in July written by you know, Admiral Hillencotter, whatever. Okay, there's a name on that. It's claimed to have been written by Hillencotter. We'll take that one. Now I need to go to the web or to whatever archives and whatever is available. And let's, I'm going to find some stuff written by Hillencotter 
that nobody disputes. And I'm going to retype that. And that'll be my control sample against which I will test the unknown. So it had to have an author name. It had to be long enough, at least two sentences. Some of the majestic documents are less than two sentences and aren't even sentences. They're just outlines. I, I couldn't, can't do anything with that. It had to have significant interest or content. What I mean by this is, again, I had to, I had to trim them, again, based upon financial considerations. Did the document say anything interesting about aliens or alien bodies or extraterrestrials or extraterrestrial technology? I wanted good ones. Okay, I wanted interesting ones. I wanted prose text, no outlines, no table of contents. I wanted primary, not secondary witnesses as author. I, wanted, I, wanted, I went after people who were, who were there, okay, who were on the inside, like members of Majestic 12 or something like that. And I knew there was a known fraudulence factor. Stanton Friedman has done a lot of work doing his own checking on the Majestic documents. And if you go to his website, he has seven there that he, to my satisfaction, have, have, has proven. He's proven that seven of them are fakes. I threw a couple in and didn't tell Dr. Chasky I was doing it. I wanted to see if she'd catch them. So I put a couple in that I knew were bogus. That was my own little backup test. Here are the ones that I did, that I had tested. There are nine authors. So you remember which button to push here, yes. FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Marshall, Helen Cotter, Twining, Vannevar Bush, and Dulles. These are the documents that I picked right here. I believe they add up to 17. Uh, this is just word count, character count. I, I didn't know if that was important to Dr. Chasky or not. I don't know if, if it was, but I threw it in when I sent her the spreadsheet. So here are the documents. FDR to Marshall, FDR on non-terrestrial science. That's kind of a famous one. Truman to Twining, July 9th, 47. Truman to Forrestal, Eisenhower to Twining, Eisenhower to the Director of Central Intelligence, so on. You can read the list here. These are the ones that I selected. Here are the ones that I matched them against. In other words, I wanted to find a good set of control documents. I, I wanted to be sensitive to same length, uh, same genre, like memo. I wanted to find memos. You know, if it was longer, I wanted to find a, like a longer letter. I wanted to try to you know, be sensitive to matching sort of the, you know, the genre category, the literary category. And these are the ones that I selected from a, I have a bigger pool of these, but I tried to get a good, you know, good number, again, matching word counts and character counts, too. So for FDR, I had five. Truman, I had five. Eisenhower had three. Kennedy had three. Marshall had four. Hill and Cotter had three. Twining, I was able to find two, and, and a good long one, so that I could sort of match the, the white-hot report in terms of length and, it, and discussing similar, uh, had similar content as well technological discussion, that kind of thing. Uh, Vannevar Bush, some letters that he had written, and then Dulles, I found two knowns for him. Now here's what was done. We had the unknown, or we had, it was, it's, this is the, excuse me, the, the known author, FDR. These are the ones that nobody disputes. So here's our FDR pool, as it were. Procedurally, Computational stylistic comparisons were run between each pool. There's an FDR pool, there's a Hill and Cotter pool, there's a Kennedy pool, there's you know, a Dulles pool. She compared, I didn't know she was going to do this, and I didn't understand why at the, at the time, but I do now. She took every pool, ran it through her program to get the stylistic patterns, and then she compared every known pool against all the other known pools. Now, why would, why would she do that? Well, the result was a similarity score that assessed how similar the stylistic elements of the known documents were to the unverified. She, she wanted to, let me just back up here a second. Well, let's go forward here. She took all the, the known pools, compared them against each other, and then she took every known pool and compared them against every unknown. That's probably a better way to say it. The purpose of the step, actually this one and the last one, was to detect how similar 
one known document pool was to another known document pool for the purpose of ranking how dissimilar each of the other known pools was to each other. Why is that important? One would assume that it would be obvious, it should be obvious that the nine known groups, the nine known pools, are going to be radically different from each other because they're nine authors we already know. They shouldn't have any evidence of being written by the same person because we all know who they are. Nobody disputes the documents. So that should be sort of self-evident. But by obtaining similarity scores for all the known document pools when compared to each other, which really amount to dissimilarity scores, since one already knows they have different authors, one can see if the score for the known document pool of an author, say FDR, compared to the unverified document pool for FDR is significantly better or more similar as one would expect. In other words, let me try to put this in plain English. In other words, you would expect if you had nine unknown authors, you had nine uh, claims to authorship. There were 17 documents that I had tested written by nine different people. For each of those nine different people, I had a pool of things that everybody knows that they wrote. You would think that all of those pools compared to each other, they're going to be radically different. It would really be odd. It would really be odd if the pools that you know are going to be different were actually more similar to the unknown than the unknown's known pool was to that unknown document. Let's say myself and Guy Malone and we'll throw in my wife. Okay, there's three of us. If we tested pools, you know, document pools for my wife, myself, and Guy, well, of course, all three of those are going to be highly dissimilar. It would really be weird if an, an unknown document from me, or something that someone said, you wrote that, Heiser, if that was actually more similar to like my wife's pool than it was to my own pool, that would really be strange. That would really be a mark that I did not write that thing. Okay, if, it, if there was a greater dissimilarity. So she compared everything against everything else. Then she ranked similarity scores. The similarity score of an unverified document was ranked to its corresponding known document pool. And that was ranked alongside the similarity scores of all the other knowns. In the rankings, and I'm going to show you the rankings here in a moment, the lowest numerical figure, and again, her, her program spits out numbers. It spits out this score. The lowest numerical figure represents the known document pool that was the most like the document being tested. Okay, so whichever group, she, she had all the groups, and she'd say she would put one in the top slot in her spreadsheet. This pool is the most like the style of this document being tested. In the following spreadsheet, the, this lowest number is listed in the top slot for each unverified document. The lowest similarity score, again, the lowest number, the score that occupies the top slot identifies the real author in just under 91% of her validation tests. The bottom line, if the unverified document was genuine, and by genuine I mean if it was written by the person whose name is on it, one would expect its known document pool to occupy the first slot in the similarity score ranking. The circumstance would be a match. If, if the unverified matches the known pool, the known is in the first slot. Here's what we mean. Here are the test results. In the left-hand column is the document being tested. This is FDR number one. Remember I had that spreadsheet up a few slides before giving you the ones that I had tested. For FDR number one, the FDR pool is down here in the fourth slot. The first slot is occupied by the JFK pool. What that means is that the JFK pool of documents stylistically is more similar to this document that claims to have been written by FDR than the ones FDR wrote. That's bad. <laughs> okay, if you're looking for a match, that's bad. 
What you're looking for is for the blue to be in the same, in this slot, so that there's blue across the board. That's a match. FDR1 fails. FDR2 fails. Here are the documents if you want the names. Make sure I didn't skip one. Okay. This is colored for a reason, and I will tell you what the reason is in a moment. Truman 1, way down here. Now, you know, I shouldn't say way down there because that's not fair. Basically, if you're not in number one, you know, it, it's just not a match. And it's not necessarily, this is really awful. It would be better if it was three. That, that isn't how the testing works. You either match or you don't. Truman 1 fails. Truman 2 fails. Again, here are the documents. Dwight D. Eisenhower 1 fails, but narrowly. You'll notice JFK is in red. Back here, JFK is in red. Back here, JFK is in red. We'll talk about that in a moment, too. Eisenhower 1 fails. Eisenhower 2 fails. JFK, I only tested one of those, failed. Marshall 1 fails. Marshall 2 fails. Hill and Cotter 1 fails. Hill and Cotter 2 fails. Hill and Cotter 3 fails. Twining 1 fails. Twining 2 fails. Twining 3 is a hit. By Chasky's methods, this document is authentic. It was really written by Twining to General Shulman. To the best of, of 21st century technological methods. Bush fails. Dulles fails, and I believe that's the end. Only one of the 17 majestic documents tested can be considered to have been written by the person whose name they bear as author. This is only 17 of them. Keep that in mind. In eight of the 17, the JFK document pool occupied the first slot. And when, when Dr. Chasky sent me the results by email and we chatted on the phone, she goes, this was really weird. I've never seen anything like that. That does not mean that JFK wrote them. <laughs> Rather, here's what it does mean. These eight documents had roughly the same degree of similarity to this pool, and it suggests, but it doesn't prove, that these eight documents could have been produced by the same person. It doesn't prove it, but it hints at it. And her response was, well, we would need to do some more. There's a, she says, there are some things I can do to that to make that a little tighter, but it's like, pay me. <laughs> and, you know, she deserves it. I mean, I'm not taking anything uh, from her. Let's go back here. Why do I have blue? Can anybody guess? Anybody really familiar with the Majestic documents could guess this. I think this is our first blue. There's a blue, Truman 1. It's a blue, Marshall 2. Blue, Hill and Cotter 3. Blue, Twining 2. These are the ones that Stan Friedman has established are fakes. She got all four of them. She did good. Now, comments on the results. Are UFOs to be consigned to mythology because of the test results? Is ufology a waste of time in terms of this research or in terms of you investing your time in it? No. That would be ridiculous to conclude. The genuineness of the UFO phenomenon, whatever its true ma nature might be, does not depend on the majestic documents. I think we all know that. But for those who you know, might be disturbed by this, it doesn't depend on these documents. Stanton Friedman, again, he's already pegged seven of them as fakes. Stan is an honest guy. And he, he'd be the first one to say it. And it's not like he and I agree on, on everything or interpretation. But it doesn't depend on these. More accurately, what you can say is that no one should base any arguments or conclusions about UFOs on the basis of these documents that I've had tested. That would be flawed thinking and flawed research. You're going to base conclusions based on these. 
you, you're, you're just really on, on poor footing in terms of, of research. The documents say more about someone's will to deceive, in my view, or a desire to move people to a certain conclusion about UFOs than anything else. It doesn't invalidate UFOs as a phenomenon. It doesn't invalidate the question of whether there's extraterrestrial life. Those questions do not depend on the majestic documents. The testing correlates Stanton Friedman's position on the fraudulence of certain majestic documents. Uh, Friedman's work here has not been accepted by every ufologist. I'm on his side because you know, he, we got the double whammy here. I mean, if you go to his website, he's done a lot of really, uh, I think, good grunt work finding documents that were, were faked and then words were changed, vocabulary was changed to, to convert them into a majestic document. What we know now is one of the majestic documents. Chasky's methods validate his conclusions. He's right on those documents. While the validity of the UFO phenomena, phenomenon is not undermined by the results, documentary support for the alien explanation of UFOs and the alien explanation for Roswell is weakened. It is not invalidated, it's weakened. Why? Because a lot of the documents here that failed the test were among those that testified to like bodies or you know, had said something specific about Roswell. Now there's lots of other documents that talk about Roswell. There's lots of other documents. Well, not, not a lot that talk about bodies, but there are some. So again, you have to, you have to be precise in what we're saying and in the conclusions that you draw from it. It's weakened, but it's, you know, it's not invalidated. It's not overturned. Although more testing needs to be done, the results cast a pall on the majestic material. But again, there's a lot of it that I didn't test. I didn't test documents that don't have author names. I couldn't. Now, there are ways you can get at that. We'll talk about that here, future prospects. I would say that, that where this is helpful in ufology is I'm, I'm hoping it will, it will encourage people to focus on more reliable evidence. We have a, there's a lot of serious researchers in UFO studies that, that really do it for a living or do it you know, really full time even if they have other jobs. I'm not one of those. Okay? We know who those people are. And if this helps them zero in on better cases, things that, that are really more fruitful, great. Okay, don't, don't waste your time on things that just don't survive modern testing. Additional testing, and that is to move from 90% up to the 95 range that, that Chasky works in regularly. Um, that's just a matter of being able to afford it. And this was a self-funded operation. This is not cheap. This is how Chasky earns her living, and she has every right to do it. She earned her PhD. She's earned her keep in the field. She's a leader among the field. And if you want more done, if I want more done, I need to raise the money. Okay? I am not a full-time ufologist. I wanted to know. Okay, now, Dr. Chasky told me something halfway through the process that I did not know. She said, you know, when you asked me to do this, the reason I accepted it so, so quickly was that I had seen it before. She had been approached by Robert Wood and Ryan Wood to do the same thing four or five years ago. And I said, you're kidding. She said, no, I'm not. I said, why didn't you do it? She said, they just lost interest. They backed away from it. I don't know why, and I, Mike, I don't know why either. You know, it wasn't that expensive. I mean, it, I took a little hit, okay? I'm not gonna spend any more of my own money on it. I wanna know that, what I need is 500 people to buy the preliminary report. I have a, I have a show uh, Thursday, July 12th on Coast to Coast AM. This is gonna be one of the topics of the show. And if I can't get 500 people to care to raise the money for all the rest of the stuff that she can do, then to me that says something. That means I move on to something else. I mean, I'm still gonna be interested. I'll do other UFO kind of things, things I'm interested in, but I can't afford any more. So if there ain't 500 people that care, I guess they're not important. But then the researchers ought to quit talking about them. Okay, it, it, I, I take a no-nonsense approach to this. It's put up or shut up, okay? If you're gonna say that, that we, we want science applied to UFO studies, well then let's do it. If you don't want it done, then quit talking about it. And you know, I, 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 
I'm interested. I, I want to be able for her to just do everything she can do. So hopefully that'll be the result. If she gets to do that by applying more testing results, here's some of the stuff she could do. Now, if you discover, okay, if, if, if she does all the full battery of testing on, on every document that has an author, there were a few that you know, I, I excluded you know, based upon the reasons that I gave you. One, the first thing I'd ask you to do is, okay, let, let's get everything that has an author, run all the tests on that, run, run everything you have, throw everything you've got at it, these 17 plus the other stragglers, and then when you have a, a very sophisticated body of stylistic patterns, then what I want you to do is I want you to run those patterns against the stuff that doesn't have an author and see what hits, what matches, and what doesn't. Now that doesn't mean necessarily, it could mean that, oh, here's this anonymous document, we don't know who wrote it. Hillencotter wrote it. That would help, you know, UFO historians like a Rich Dolan, okay? Because now, now you know with a high degree of certainty who wrote that thing. And you can situate it historically. It'll also turn up things like, hey, no, wait, we had these eight that were similar. Here's like 10 more. And I wonder whose doorstep those documents showed up on. We might want to ask that person about where he or she got the documents in the first place because it doesn't look good. Okay, that's the kind of thing you can do, even with stuff that doesn't have an author name. But that takes hours and hours of computer time, hours and hours of validation tests. And like I said, she's not cheap. So that's where I want to go with it. I don't know if it'll ever happen. If you want the report, this is the only place you can get it. And I didn't bring any with me. Why? Because I want to find 500 people who care. I don't want to hand it out so that you can hand it to all your friends. I want to find 500 people who care. I get 500 people who will pay $11.95 and it'll get done. All of it. So this is where you go. You go to my website. This is what I'm going to tell the Coast to Coast people. I'm going to be honest. Look, I'm not going to Tahiti. Okay? You won't find me in Tahiti. You will find me sending, writing checks to Dr. Carol Chasky to do the rest of it. Now, I'll leave this up, but that's all I have. So what, what time is it? Q and A. and some others into this kind of testing. This is not what I had done. This has already been done before. This has limitations. They did things like physical dating of ink and pencil and you know, do, the, do, the, do the keys on certain typewriters of the period in which this document was supposed to be typed. Do they match the typeface on the document? What about the ink, its composition? Formula, dating formula, how you know, the the sort of outline method or the salutation method uh, that was used in a document, does that jive with similar styles that were used in the period? So it was sort of a chronological testing. They, had, they did testing on watermarks, chemical composition of the paper. Again, these are physical tests. Comparison with known events, handwriting they've done a little bit with, the stamps on certain majestic documents, are they consistent with stamps used in the period, that sort of thing. All that has been done. I did not want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I think we should be thankful to the Woods that they've you know, really put the effort into doing what they've done. But this surpasses what they've done in, in significant ways. Now, as far as a linguistic testing claim, some of you are thinking, well, I've read about you know, 
I read somewhere before that the majestic documents have been tested by a linguist. Well, not really. Kind of, sort of. And frankly, no. Now here's the quotation that you might be thinking. This is Stanton Friedman. And I don't mean this in any way negatively towards Stanton. He, he was honest. This is what he had done. And we're going to talk a little bit about it. At the suggestion of attorney Bob Bletchman, I had obtained 27 examples of Hill and Cotter's various writings from the Truman Library. He hands them to a, doc, uh, a linguist, and the guy was a linguist. I'm used, to, I'm used to saying you're live. Folks, welcome back to the Roswell UFO Conference. You're about to see Dr. Michael S. Heiser, PhD. This is one of the most anticipated lectures of this entire event. And believe it or not, responses to this lecture are already being circulated among ufological circles. Responses and debate about what Mike is going to bring, and he hasn't even given the article yet. He hasn't given the lecture yet. It's very groundbreaking. Um, to give you his personal history is here. I'll give you that in a second. But Mike's also no stranger to Roswell. He's been here since 2003 presenting at our Ancient of Days UFOs and Theology Conferences, as well as the San Francisco area Bay Area Conference and the Washington, D.C. X Conference on Could Christianity Accommodate a Genuine ET Reality? Very good personal friend. His wife, Drina, is here as well. Uh, they're people I go to with my problems. He's been a really good friend, inspiration, theologically. I love having his uh, credentials and really his uh, humble manner uh, representing uh, the conferences that I've been able to put together, as well as making Roswell look good like so many of these other people have done. I'll give Mike more time with the microphone. Though. Of what we're going to be going over, there's going to be an introduction, an overview of the process, the sources for the documents, how they were selected, and they were, they were selected according to the methods that, frankly, I could afford because this is self-funded. Uh, I'm going to be pitching you and pitching a very large audience on the 12th of July. I'm going to be a guest on Coast to Coast. And what I need to fund further research is I need to find 500 people who care. If there ain't 500 people who care about this, then that will say something to me, and it will probably say something to the wider UFO community. I'm going to go through the results then and comment on them and then talk about what could be done in the future. Now, the basic idea for this came to me when I was at the X conference in 2005. It was during a lecture by Ryan Wood and the Woods, Robert Wood, Dr. Robert Wood, and his son Ryan, <coughs> who are most well known for their work on the Majestic Documents, they are not connected with this study, this research at all. Uh, to my, I don't even know if they know about it because it's really been under the radar. Uh, but I got an idea as I was listening to Ryan Wood and he had the word stylometry on one of his PowerPoint slides. And, and being a biblical scholar, I knew what stylometry was, and I'm going to explain that to you today. And I thought, hmm, I wonder why they haven't done that, because he said we haven't done that. But it's something he threw out there that could be done. And I, and I thought about it for a while, and it, it just, you know, one thing led to another. I got busy with my job. But around January, I thought, you know, I should really do this. I think I can save enough money to get it done, so let's try it, and I did. Now the need, of course, is that it's never been attempted, and I wanted to try to build on other testing. Here's what the Woods have done, and they've really put a lot of work, a lot of effort, and so has Stanton Friedman. Oh, you can read you his brief, no lie, biographical sketch, that Mike Heiser earned his PhD in Hebrew Bible and ancient Semitic languages from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he has also earned two MA degrees in the fields of ancient history, Egyptology and Syria-Palestine from the University of Pennsylvania and Biblical Hebrew and Semitic languages from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. After teaching on the undergraduate level for 12 years, Mike took his current position as academic editor for Logos Bible Software, a software research company that creates ancient language research software and digital resources for studying the ancient and biblical world. 
His academic interests include Israelite religion, Northwest Semitic languages, Second Temple, Second Temple Jewish literature, Jewish and Christian monotheism in the early common era, and biblical theology. Mike is best known to those interested in ufology for his critiques of the ancient astronaut theories and ancient texts, as well as his interest in how mainstream religion might respond to an ET reality. His novel, The Facade, deals with all of these subjects. Mike will no doubt become well known in the UFO community for being the first researcher to have the majestic documents tested by modern computational linguistic methods. Please welcome up Dr. Michael S. Heiser, PhD. Are we on or should I hold the one? Okay. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. And this is, uh, as Guy told you or hinted at, this is a first. So you'll be able to say at some point, I was there when you know, Heiser did his session in Roswell on testing the majestic documents. What you're going to see is something that has never been done before. I don't know why. Uh, it, it could have been done in the last 15 to 20 years. But no one has undertaken it. And I may say a little bit about that as we go through. But what I want to do is sort of take you through. I had to make up a title a few months ago. So I said, hey, authentication and interpretation. What you're really going to get is authentication. Uh, I, I'm sure I'll be able to, use, to leave a good bit of Q&A uh, for questions. And then we may get into interpretation at that point. Uh, because I only got the test results in June. Uh, I, I, had, I sent these things off to a leader in the field and had to wait, um, just like you know, some of you have had to wait weeks and weeks and weeks since you heard a little bit about this. I had to wait months to get the results back. And so I want to, uh, of course, give you the results, but I also want to take you through the process. What, what did I do? What did I have done? What does it mean? A little bit of background on it so you know the significance of it. This is a good case of hard science being applied to UFO studies. Now, I've said many times before, I don't have a dog in this fight. I am not a professional ufologist. I have a day job. I don't do this for a living. I don't need any money from it. Okay, I just want to know. And there are areas that I'm taught in, I'm trained in. I want to apply those to questions like, well, are the majestic documents real or not? I mean, what, what can we say? What, what can be tested? That sort of thing. And so that's what I did. I had no idea what to expect. So with that said, let's jump in here. This is a basic outline.